G'day guys, Mac with the Outer Circle, and today's episode, I'm going to be talking about rules, because, well, at the time of recording, I'm not sure what exactly I'm going to call the video, but probably something on the lines of Games Workshop has a rules problem. You see, it's called Games Workshop. It's in the title, Games. And Warhammer is just the most iconic name associated with that company. That's the brand name that everyone thinks of. We don't think Games Workshop products, we think Warhammer. And the problem is, Warhammer has very badly written rules. And this has always been true. But I feel like in the last decade, it's demonstrably dropped off a cliff. Like the writers aren't even trying, or people who shouldn't be writing are getting involved in the process and giving feedback that is incorrect. I know from having spoken to playtesters in the UK, Europe, Australia, and the United States of America that there are issues with the feedback that players are giving to the company when they test things out. The testing is not being taken into account. Essentially, they are ignored when they bring up issues. So the company wants to produce games. They tell us that they're a games company. Then they talk about how they make the best miniatures in the world and then fail to deliver on excellent games. They produce fine games. Perfectly acceptable, in most circumstances, games. It is very rare that they produce something that is exceptional or outstanding. And I know this is a bitter pill for people to swallow, but this is just the state of things. And so what I've done is I've gone through and admittedly, very admittedly, cherry-picked examples. But I've picked them because these obvious examples should speak for themselves. Because you say... In your heart of hearts, if this is the condition that they're releasing these rules in with these obvious imbalances, there is a deeper problem here because it shouldn't be this severe, these issues of balance, when something is released as brand new, especially when they're coming out of the same book or released in the same time period as part of a bigger compendium. And because of this, it should just be a case of, well, that should have been picked up. And even if it wasn't picked up when it happened, it should have been FAQ'd or errated or fixed in some capacity afterwards. So the example I'm going to start with here is, again, cherry-picked. Pick on me in the comments all you like for it. But I'm going to take Sigismund, first captain of the Imperial Fists, and I'm going to take Lord Chaplain Gnomus right hand who is the Keeper of the Keys of Prometheus. So Sigismund, he's the number two guy in the Imperial Fists, and Gnomus Right Hand is the number two guy in the Salamanders. So comparable roles within their legions. Now, Chaplain Gnomus Right Hand, it's in the name. He is a chaplain. He is there to buff and give fortitude to his force. Sigismund is there to be a beat stick. Totally cool with this. How's that play out on the tabletop? Because these guys are one Space Marine's points apart in price. That's it. One tactical Marine, well, actually, an Assault Marine, is the difference between these two. But what I want to be seeing here is I want to be seeing Sigismund have a stat line that is superior to Gnomus Right Hand, but Gnomus Right Hand having a series of buffs and abilities he gives his army that just brings them up in order to represent what he's supposed to be, considering they are functionally the same price. So let's start. Sigismund has right hand beat on weapon skill by a healthy factor. Uh, Right hand got a buff. He was previously weapon skill 4 and ballistic skill 4. Sigismund does not have good ballistic skill, but he doesn't actually have a weapon that makes use of it in the form of a mastercrafted bolt pistol. So not the biggest deal in the world. Uh, right hand has the slightly superior skill, and his weapon is a combi flamer, not a dragon's breath, so not even his legion weapon, it's just a regular combi flamer. And of course, the flamer part requires no ballistic skill. So, Gnomus right hand has him beat there, but the weapon skill thing, weapon skill 7, they're both strength 4, they're both initiative 5, Sigismund has more wounds, though. Now, wounds are kind of a big deal. If you go back to the 3.5 era of Warhammer, you learn that a wound on a Toughness 4 model was typically worth about 10 to 20 points, depending if they're a character or an individual model. 
Even if we go with just 10 points, Sigismund has already almost made up the points gap on just the extra wound, and yet he has multiple points more weapon skill. Ballistic skill is of course a degrading stat and not really worth as much. Attacks wise, they're identical, same as in leadership and saves. So, weapon skill and attacks, how does this play out? Well, we have Dark Star falling versus the Black Sword. So Sigmund's Black Sword is plus two strength, so he'll strike at strength six. Whereas the Dark Star Falling in Nomus right hand is also plus two strength, and you can start to see why I picked these two for a comparison. They're both AP2, which is great. However, right hand is unwieldy. Hmm. So he strikes last in close combat, and that's where the benefits end. Well, what is the Black Sword? It's master crafted, unlike the Salamander's weapon, so getting a reroll to hit and has instant death on all of its attacks. Instant death, you think about that. That's any, that's Dreadnought, that's Automata, that's anyone he fights is gonna be suffering instant death, as long as they don't have Eternal Warrior. Darkstar Falling does not have any of that. So that is a huge amount of extra attack potential that Sigismund has thanks to that weapon. What about in Warlord traits then? Well, Sigismund has the Slayer of Kings. Plus one victory point gained uh, for all units in his detachment, in his army, that is. And uh, if they are, in addition to gaining any objectives or whatever, as long as they slay the Warlord. So, eh, it's okay, it's a victory point. Uh, and plus one to the total number of wounds caused in each combat that they're involved in. Okay. And on top of that, gets to make an additional reaction during the opponent uh, movement phase, as long as he's not been removed as a casualty. So let's say there's two real things in there. Plus one victory point for Slay the Warlord in a challenge, and uh, plus one to the number of wounds caused in uh, combats. Not great buffs, and Sigismund's not known for that because he's a combat beat stick. So right hand, who should be known for buffs, being a chaplain, has... Any model with the Dreadnought unit type and the Legion is a study Salamander special rule within six inches of him may add plus two to their charge distance. In addition, you get to make an additional reaction in the shooting phase. So there's not two buffs there, there is only one. Plus two inches charge distance. Does it affect the army? No. Sigismund's affects the entire army, plus one to all your combat res. And that plus one victory point for Slay the Warlord, again, it's going to be game wide. This is plus two to charge distance. It's specifically limited to Dreadnoughts and only Dreadnoughts within six inches of Gnomus right hand. So it's incredibly niche in its application. And Dreadnoughts, for the record, are faster than this character. So if you're crossing the table with this character and those Dreadnoughts trying to get closer to the enemy to charge them, the Dreadnoughts actually have to stay back some distance in order to keep coherency with this character. And of course, you would have to cluster your Dreadnoughts up around this character in order to keep them within that very confined bubble. So, realistically, it's not a very good Warlord trait. Okay, maybe we can make up for it then in War Gear. Well, they've both got Iron Halos, so same invulnerable save. They've both got Artificer Armor, so same regular save. They've both got Frag and Crack Grenades. Well, the difference here is the mantle of the Elder Drake for Chaplain Gnomus right hand. He's going to count as battle hardened. So to instant death him, you'll need to count as strength 10 to do it. Or, like Sigismund, have a weapon that just causes instant death. Now this seems like a huge buff to Gnomus right hand, and in normal circumstances it is. However, Sigismund in the special rules has eternal warrior. He is immune to all forms of instant death, not just strength-based instant death, like Gnome's right hand is. And keeping in the theme of special rules there, they both have Legion's Astartes, they both have independent character, they both have Master of the Legion, except for the fact that right hand is stubborn, has hatred everything, Sigismund has <laughs> fearless, Adamantium Will 3+, Death's Champion, which we can get to, 
Precision strikes three plus, so he can pick on a three to hit. He gets to pick who he strikes in close combat, and there's no avoiding it. Those wounds have to land on that model. Fantastic for instant death attacks. Mm, yeah, there's a slight difference here. And of course, Dolorous Fighter as well for Sigismund. So let's go down then. What does Dolorous Fighter and Death's Champion mean? Well, Sigismund and his unit are going to get plus two inches to all charge distances and sweeping advance rolls made for them. And if he's in detachment, he unlocks tr Templar Brethren who are an elite's choice as the troops' choices. And plus two to all charge distances. Hang on. So that's any unit he joins is effectively getting the buff that Gnomus Right Hand's Warlord trait gives the Dreadnoughts that maintain their close proximity to him. Hmm. Then we have Dolorous Fighter. When a challenge is issued, any combat includes Sigismund. Sigismund must always accept the challenge. Uh, unless, obviously, you had someone like Rogue Dawn there. Uh, if the opposing player does not issue a challenge, then Sigismund must issue the challenge. Additionally, when fighting a challenge, successful and vulnerable saves taken against Sigismund's attacks must be re-rolled. So I put it to you, the viewer, for pretty much identical points units, Sigismund is in, I think, a pretty good place. Maybe even ever so slightly under points. Maybe 240 points would be closer to the mark, but 230 is respectable. Do we think that Gnomus Right Hand, with that loadout, and that Warlord trait, and those special rules, is on the same level as this character? And again, I don't expect any character to be on the same level as Sigismund in close combat. But if we're going to pay the points for them, we should be seeing them getting some points back in other areas of the game. Right Hand should be providing numerous buffs for the army much like some of the Primarchs do. Instead, he's providing very, very circumstantial buffs to a very, very niche unit in the army who doesn't need a buff, frankly. You don't need to improve Dreadnoughts. So why has this character been written this way? And this is the reworked Gnomus right hand at that. This is the version where you can see in pink here where the weapon skill and skill has been improved, and yet they've stuck with this points values. This does not make sense. Why has this character been written this way? And I know I've cherry-picked these two choices, but as you can see, they have many of the same items of war gear, they have many of the same special rules, and they have very, very uh, similar stats on their war gear. Dark Star Falling and the Black Sword are almost identical, it's just the Black Sword has many more special rules attached to it. Well, two more. But you can see here that this is such a simple thing to look at. You, anyone who has a functioning frontal cortex should be able to look at this and go, these are not the same. So why are they being priced the same? Why are they being treated the same? Why were they written this way and sold to us the player this way? It's not correct. And this is the problem we see throughout all of Games Workshop's works. They don't take things that are identical and play them the same. They take two things that are identical and then assign them different values. If I was to give you a, an example that's not on the screen, if we go back to 6th or 7th edition Warhammer 40,000, and or even 5th edition, because it was true there as well, Space Marines and Chaos Space Marines were the same points. Actually, it was one point cheaper. I have lied to you. It was one point cheaper per model for a Chaos Space Marine. But what did that one point give the regular Space Marine? For a start, you had access to more war gear options. However, the Chaos Space Marine player could take a larger unit. No one ever did, but you could. Then the Space Marines had, and they should know no fear, so you could never run them down in close combat, which is fantastic. And they always regrouped no matter how many miniatures they'd lost. Not having that special rule is huge, for those who aren't familiar. The other thing Marines had was chapter tactics. If you had a 10-man squad, you might end up playing an objectives mission where you had a lot more objectives to cover on the battlefield. You go, cool, I'm going to split my 10-man squad into two 5-man squads. And of course, you've got your chapter special rules on top of all of this. Chaos got none of that. That's how long this issue has been around. It's been around for 10 years. 
So why do I still have to talk about it? Now moving on from Sigismund, I want to show you some warlord traits. The first here is the Solar Marshal from our beloved Imperial Fists, who I'm assured are not broken. In this warlord trait, the warlord always grants plus one weapon skill when locked in combat with one or more enemy units that have the traitor allegiance. And it's to them and their unit. You think about that. Plus one weapon skill. In addition, where that means you can get weapon skill six units, so all the weapon skill five units that are everywhere in this game can't leverage that weapon skill against you. That's a very powerful buff. And this is on all the time. Why do I bring it up? Because this warlord trait is supposed to be equal to this, the Seneschal of the Keys for the Dark Angels. Where it gives you effectively the exact same thing you get a choice if it's your weapon skill or your ballistic skill. Again, weapon skill 5 or plus 1 to your weapon skill going to 6 in many instances is a lot more beneficial than plus 1 ballistic skill. Very, very clutch circumstances you would use that, and there are many other ways of getting it. Master of Signals being probably the best example. But this is for one turn only. So the Dark Angels get plus 1 weapon skill once per game. But the Imperial Fists get plus one weapon skill all game. Why are these considered equal? This is a clear-cut example of, what well, favoritism, but of bad writing. And now one last example before we go. This here is not a great photo, I admit, um, that I took. But the Invictus Suzerain Squad versus the Praetorian Breacher Squad. 40 point difference, 8 points per model. What does that 8 points buy you? Well, let's see. They've got the same movement, same weapon skill, same ballistic skill, same strength, toughness, wounds, initiative. 3 attacks versus 1 attack. So 3 times the damage output. That seems like kind of a big deal. What about leadership? Well, it's higher on the Invictus Suzerain. Uh, and thanks to their Honor Bearers rule, they will uh, be able to be taken as a command squad, which means they can take a banner. If they take a Legion Standard, they're going to be line, they're going to be scoring, uh, and they're going to be fearless. But even if they don't take that, they'll have the Order of Ultramar special rule, which will give any unit around them plus one leadership up to nine. Hmm. And, of course, they have a better save. So eight points for three times the close combat output and damage, for a higher leadership, a leadership aura that affects all units in the proximity, as well as being about 16% harder to kill with standard weapons, and of course all of the AP3 weapons will have no effect on them. In addition to that, they have the Argyrum uh, Pattern Boarding Shield, which is a far superior Pattern Boarding Shield, it's the Ultramarine specific one, and they've got the Legatine Axe, which is an AP2 at initiative weapon. And, of course, they have access to Thunder Hammer on the Sergeant, which is always a lovely little thing. Uh, and, in fact, any Suzerain may take a Pleasant Pistol, but nobody ever does that because they're not very good. As for dedicated transports, they have the same sort of options, and these are both Elite's units. So, whilst there is a points difference here, it's visible for everyone to see, eight points for three times damage output, 16% increased survivability, increased leadership. Uh, what does the Praetorian Breachers have? Well, Hammer of Wrath 1. So you're going to inflict a Strength 4 hit for every Breacher that makes base to base with an enemy model, provided the Ultramarines successfully charge. And they've got Chosen Warriors. They can all accept and issue challenges, but they're only armed with a Power Sword. And if you're lucky, the squad sergeant may take a fist or an axe, but the guy he's going up against has a hammer, or even just their axe. Do we see some issues here again in points? These two units are not correctly costed against one another. So 
how do you begin to unwrap this? How do you begin to right the ship, as it were, of points, values, and rules writing with Games Workshop? Well, I think the obvious thing to state here is that issues like this that you're seeing on this page should not be occurring in the first place. The problems should be in the soft stat line balancing, not the hard stat line balancing. And what do I mean here? Well, the hard stat lines in the game are the number values that you see in front of you. Weapon skill versus weapon skill, ballistic skill versus ballistic skill, all these special rules versus all these special rules. All of that is very easy to correctly price because you take a basic profile, you assign a cost or a price to every upgrade you add to that profile, and it's a logarithmic increase. What do I mean? Well, if you have a one wound model and you give him an extra wound, you might call that five points. You give him a second wound, it's now a 10 points on top of that. You give him a third wound, it's now 20 points on top of that. It, it scales up exponentially because the above that you're giving is exponentially scaling in its abilities within a defined set of parameters because that first little five point upgrade you give, that first extra wound, may not mean much if it's on just a basic power armored miniature because he'll still be instant kill by anything strength 8, he's still wearing just standard power armor. It's not that much of an improvement to him. But once you start adding more and more of those wounds to it, it can have quite a strong, profound effect, especially depending on their war gear. So that's where the easy points are. That's the easy balancing in the game. The hard part is the interconnected relationship within these forces. What if I put this character in this unit? It will give them all these abilities. What if I take this Rite of War? It does all of these things. Those are harder to get your head around. But that's not where the problems are occurring. The problems are occurring here at the most basic level. When it comes to taking two models and putting them side by side and going, well, hang on, I can buy two Invictus Suzerain or I can buy three Breaches, Praetorian Breaches for the same points. The two Invictus Suzerain are going to throw out six attacks a turn. The three Praetorians are going to throw out three attacks a turn. The Praetorians, uh, in all likelihood, if they do hit and wound, it's going to be two plus save for the suzerain, but if the suzerain hit and wound, which they find easier, then it's going to be five plus invulnerables for the breaches. There is no way the breaches can win that fight, despite being equal points, equally priced, considered to be equals in every sense of the word. They are not equals, they are far from it. And we saw this with Sigismund and Gnomus right hand. So... One of the things I would like to see here, and this is the point where we go into improvements, is Games Workshop needs to start writing an algorithm. They actually need to pay some money, hire some mathematicians and some game designers who will sit down and work out in a very simple, clear-cut, black-and-white manner what the points values of every unit in the game should be. And this is the on-paper, this should cost about this. And where your playtesting should come in is when you actually put them on the battlefield against one another, what does it feel like? And that's where the game designers get to use a little bit of human intuition and go, oh, it feels a bit too good. Let's increase the points slightly. Or this feels like it's underperforming compared to what it costs. Let's decrease them slightly. We should be seeing slight tweaks and differences here and there at that point. What we're not seeing is that. What we are seeing is radically different units priced at completely insane points and considered equals. And of course, this goes into the basic game itself. I've spoken at length in my ongoing series about uh, understanding legion power, okay? And uh, interpreting and understanding how the legions actually play against one another and what their strengths and weaknesses are. And some, like the Imperial Fist, are so broken overpowered that, you know, when I see people defend it, I just think they're morons. I know that's a really harsh and arrogant thing to say, but it's like, if you're defending that, you have chosen willfully to ignore all of the evidence that's been placed in front of you, and this goes doubly for the writers who wrote the system, you've just ignored all the evidence put in front of you, and you're pretending there is no problem, despite everyone around you providing you with the evidence to prove there is, you're just saying, well, you know, 
I don't think there is because arbitrary reasons. Well, that's not good enough, okay? And then we show you a legion like the Salamanders. We say, well, these are clearly drastically underpowered, or worse, the Thousand Sons or the Emperor's Children Legion is Hereticus. We show you these forces and we say, look, these cannot perform. You've written bizarre rules. None of this makes sense. And that also gets ignored. So how do we fix this problem? And I think the answer is, for all of these game systems, now we can argue about the practicality of doing it from the company standpoint, because some idiot will pop in the comments and say, well, Macca, the economics of the situation, I don't care about the economics, we're about the game design, right? The economics is an entirely different argument. But in the game design, we need to write everything for an edition up front. No more of this, we're gonna release our codexes partway through. If you're going to do that, have it written at the start of the edition and you just drop it later. But everything is balanced and ready to go against each other from day one. And then they need to stay around for some time. No more of these day one FAQs unless something is broken and needs instant fixing, which if it's been written correctly and actually play tested, should not occur. Should not occur. We are not the video games industry shipping broken products. It's expected for these things to work as intended on day one. You are putting something into written form. You are not writing millions or billions of lines of code. You are writing a hundred pages on paper of units that have been played with and profiles tweaked for 30 years. If that's nearly 40 years, if that is not enough, leeway and understanding of what you're dealing with, then we have an issue here for the people who are writing the system. I know this sounds really, really harsh right now, but the people writing this are not doing a good job of it. But it's tolerated because people feel like if they turn around and they say something about it, then they're being negative and they're being unhelpful and they should just be grateful because, well, if they're not grateful for it, the company might not support the product. Well, here's the thing, the company is in it for the money. If there is no money in the product, they won't support it. And if there is money in the product, they will improve themselves to keep gaining your dollar. But right now, they don't have to improve the writing or improve themselves because you're handing over the dollars anyway. Me, the only thing I'm buying legitimate these days is books. I have no desire to buy overpriced models that underperform on the tabletop are full of issues. And I mean issues. The amount of dodgy Forge World I've received in the last few years, I've given up on it. I really have. I'm getting better quality out of China now. It's sad to say, but it's true. At the end of the day, there is a huge issue within the company. And the rules writing is paramount among these. If This is not a game that is easy to get into. None of them are a game that's easy to get to. And... 40k has not been good in a long time and 30k has taken some of the worst attributes of 40k and add them into heresy 2.0 and things like reactions also play into that that's its own kettle of fish to be unwrapped at a different point in time hopefully i'm getting through somewhere somehow to someone and people understand me like please let me know if you understand what i'm talking about here and let me know if you think there's absolutely no issue and these units are balanced. I want to hear the logic behind it. You know, beyond I think it's fine, like give me more than I think it's fine. Uh, and give me more than just I played these units on the table and I had just phenomenal rolling and it goes to show that Nomus can beat Sigismund. It's like, really? That's not proof. Like, lucky rolling. <laughs> you know, that's an unaccountable, uh, intangible thing. Let's just pretend average rolling. Sigismund is going to kill anyone pretty much any day of the week. So, yeah, give me some actual, like, constructive feedback here, guys. Anyway, back at the Outer Circle. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time.